by your heads there. With this Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, as we come before you this morning, we are eternally grateful, Lord, for the blessings, dear Lord, and the things you do for us. Dear Lord, as uh, we think about, Father, this past year and all that, Father, has been going on, dear Lord, with all of the pandemic and, dear Father, the unrest, and dear Lord, as I was walking this morning, Lord, just talking to you, Lord, I was reminded that it's been almost a year, Lord, since my accident, and Father, I thank you for every day you've given me since that day. I pray that, Lord, you would just bless our worship today, help us to lift you high, uh, let the word come forth, dear Lord, in such a way, in such a measure, that, dear Lord, it would capture the attention of people, dear Lord, and that we would understand and know that without you, we can't have life. Life comes from knowing you. I pray that you just bless our time here, and we'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Lois, I think you're probably there right now. Um, I want to give you this. That's, you know, Sandy usually gives you that, so I'll give you one from Sandy, and one from me, and one from Barb, and one from everybody else. We're so glad that you're able to just be able to see us on Sunday. So, and all you others that may be watching, uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to lift up the name of Jesus and let his uh, light shine through us the best we possibly can. This song is no Jerry Clark song. It says, God, you're so good to me, and truly he is. Amen? God, you're so good. Ah! Uh -huh. 
bright and lily of every valley that you'll ever walk through. So don't be worried and don't fear because God is with you Amen. in all your face. You know, I've been keen on the scriptures for a little while now. All things work together for good to those that love God and to those that are called according to his purpose. Uh, we need to understand something. When it says all things, that's what it means. All things. The good and the bad are working our life out for His glory. So don't grow discouraged. Don't grow weak in the midst of battle. Just understand and know that we have a great Savior that's helping us to get through everything that we will ever go through. And one day, as this old hymn says, we'll be over in the glory land. Amen? So you sing it with us. I have a home prepared where the saints to buy. Just over in the glory land And I long to be by my Savior side Just over in the glory land Just over in the glory land I'll draw on the happy angel man Just over in the glory land Just over Christ is your Savior, or if you haven't, today you can. You can say yes to Jesus Christ. Just tell him you're sorry for your sin, and tell him that you believe that he died on the cross, and that God raised him from the dead, and that he ascended back to the Father, and is seated at God's right hand, and he is your mediator between God 
uh, and yourself. And so look forward to the day when he will say, come on home, children. Your life is done down here. And, you know, I tell people this all the time, and I think they think I'm a little bit crazy, but that's okay. Um, my brother-in-law, Larry, uh, he's been gone. Uh, it's been a year, two years? It's been two years. And uh, I remember at the funeral, they were doing all the service and everything. And we got out by the graveside. I didn't have a part in the service or anything. But I, I said, can I say something? And I, I just stood up in the midst of all of them. And I said, I want to let you know something. My brother-in-law knew Jesus. And it says, even though he's not here, he's not dead. He's home with the Lord and he will be with him. And when we get there. And the same, I feel the same about everybody that's ever left this walk of life that knows Jesus as their personal Savior. You know, Sandy, I know you're probably watching. We're going to see Bill again one of these days. We're going to be over there in that land where there's no more sickness, or pain, or death. So you're going to see your husband one more time. They're going to be in all of their glory. And they, there won't be no more sickness on them. They won't have no more problems. They won't have any more difficulties. And we'll be in the same shape. We will see him as he is. And I'm looking forward to that day. Uh, while I'm here, I feel like the Lord's been saying to me, just keep doing what you're doing. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing until he decides that it's time for us to come home. But uh, I'm going to live in glory one of these days. How about you? Can you say amen to that? I'm going to live in glory one day. I'd like to stay here longer. Then man's allotted days And watch the fleeting changes Of life's uneven way But if my Savior called me Who let me come on high I'll live with Him forever In glory by His might Oh yes, I'll live in glory By and by I'll tell the same love story There
We're doing the best we can. So we know about it. Sometimes it's just, it's in the cloud. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of enemies that are trying to thwart and stop the church. Uh, I don't know if any of you seen it this week, but a young man was standing out singing with his church out in an open air parking lot. And the police came up and arrested him because he was singing a Christian song and he didn't have a mask on. And I thought, what is happening to our country? What is happening to this land of ours? So many people have turned their back on God and have lost, lost focus. I guess about the best way to do it, but they've lost focus and um, fighting amongst themselves. And, you know, the Bible even talks about there will come a day when, you know, men will turn against each other and fathers will turn against sons and sons against fathers and all that stuff. And, and you know what? If you take a stand for Jesus Christ, if you're going to stand up and proclaim Him as Lord and Savior, be ready for persecution because it's coming. Whether we like it or not, whether we think that we can endure it or not, listen, you will find out what you're made of when persecution comes. You know what? Sometimes we find out what we're made of, made of when sickness comes or when disease grabs us or when something horrible happens in our family, we find out what we're made of. And sometimes we just have to step back and say, Lord, I can't do this. I need your help. I've got to have your direction. I've got to have your guidance because if I don't have you, Lord, I can't make it. And so I pray today that you'll understand and know that you have a great Savior. He's with you in everything you face and in everything that you do. I I'm so grateful for that. I mean, I, I can go all through the week. And as long as I keep my mind and my eyes and my heart stayed on Him, I have a good week. I have a problem when I start looking at all the stuff around me. I'm kind of like Peter when he got out of the boat and he was walking on the water to go to Jesus. And he said he looked around and saw the wind boisterous and the waves that were rolling. And the scripture says, beginning to sink, he said he cried out, Lord, save me. Well, sometimes when we're sinking, we got to do the same thing. We just got to say, Lord, save me. Because if, well, if you don't save me, I'm going under for sure. So I, I, I want to encourage you today. I do. I, I just want to encourage you. I feel this in my heart. I want to encourage you to understand and know that as a child of God, not everybody's going to like you. Right. Some folks are going to hate you if you love Jesus. That's right. But you know what? Pharisees and Sadducees back in their day, they hated Jesus. They couldn't stand what... Because you, you know why they hate him? You know what? They, and, and, and I've learned this over from the past few months. But they hated him because he come to change everything. He didn't come to add on or make something uh, of the old covenant so he could add another part out of the new covenant. He came to fulfill the old so that he could establish the new. And what that told them was that I'm going to lose my job. I'm not going to get no more money. They're not going to be walking around bowing and curtsying every time they see me walk by. Let me tell you something. John the Baptist said it best, I think. I must decrease and he must increase. Listen, we must make sure that we let him increase not only before the world but also in our own lives because we need him every single day of our lives. This song says, all my hope is in Jesus. Amen. I've been changed by the Savior Felt far from above. I've been down to the river. I'm not the same. I'm redeemed by. Hey! 
Lover of my 
soul Jesus I will never let you go Take me from the mighty clay Set my feet upon the right of rock Now I know that I love you And I need you Though my world fall, I will never let you go You're my Savior that it was okay for Israel to go back home, to go back to their homeland. Now we know after that happened, then there was some more skirmishes and stuff that took place, and they got thrown from pillar to post after that. And uh, in the time when Jesus was appearing on the shores of the Galilee, um, Israel was kind of caught in uh, the turmoil of being under the rulership of the Roman Empire. And they needed, you know, something to change the situation, and uh, it hadn't changed in Jesus' day yet. Now, it was going to change, but it was going to take a crucifixion, a burial, and a resurrection for those changes to take place. But he didn't come to change what we would call the church, which is a very poor, uh, and I don't 
confuse you, but it's a very poor translation uh, of the word uh, that was in the Greek. Uh, really, it should have been translated uh, uh, Ecclesia, which was actually the called out ones. That's why in the early days of the church, they didn't have a name. They didn't call them Baptists or Presbyterians or Pentecostals or Catholics. They were people called of the way. The, the way. And the, the way was, Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so in this setting that we're looking at, um, and if I have a, a title for this message, it would be this. Why America is suffering. Why America is suffering. And I'm, I'm no prophet. Or, but I, I read the word. And the word speaks things to us that you can't find anyplace else. You know, you're not going to get it from a politician, that's for sure. Uh, and you're not going to get it from a movie star or some kind of rock star or country star or whatever kind of star you might uh, think you could attach your wagon to and think he's going to get you to the other side. There's only one way to the other side, and that's Jesus. He's the only way to the other side. But uh, there was a quote uh, that was given back around 1830 been used by President Reagan and, and others, uh, but it says this. Um, let me read this to you. It gives the guy's name, and yet when they studied all of his writings, uh, his name was Alex D. Toquiville. I think I'm pronouncing it right. I could not be. It's possible, too. But anyway, they gave him the, you know, they, they said he's the one that quoted this, but in his writings, he never could find it. But it said, this is what uh, he is supposed to have said. He goes, uh, a person, he's talking about himself, that visited America from France, said, not until I visited America's churches and heard her pulpit flame with righteousness did I understand the greatness and genius of America. America is great because America is good. If America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. And then there was another visitor from France that came and he said it this way. When he entered the churches in America and heard the soul equalizing and soul elevating principles of the gospel of Christ, then I learned why America was great and free and why France was a slave. You know, when you, you hear that term, America is great because America is good, we need to understand something. We've trampled, I would say, on our goodness. We've taken so much for granted. Uh, I, I want to take my time the best way I can anyway. And, uh, but uh, I think it's time for not so much a revival, but a reformation. The church needs to come together instead of being so divided. I mean, I'm so bothered, it seems, that certain denominations cannot hang out with other denominations because we have these little idiosyncrasies and things that we argue about, you know, how you get saved, how you get baptized, is the Holy Spirit real? Uh, is there still a, an infilling of the Holy Ghost? Is uh, you know, and some folks think you got to sprinkle it. Other folks think you got to be immersed, and all this stuff. And you know, they really gave us the the uh, uh, thing for how you're supposed to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And he talks about Jesus went down into the water and coming up out of the water, there was a dove that descended on him. So that lets me know something about Jesus that, you know, there was a way to be baptized, but there was also a way to be filled with the Holy Spirit because it said that Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove. And so I realized in my life when I got saved, when, I, when it first happened, I thought, well, this must be, is this all there is? You know, it's like, and, and I was pretty content with, with that's what I thought that they're all there was because you know I was happy I'd go to church on Sundays and you know the pastor decided that you know I, I was saved enough to let me sing and 
do things in the church, and I was, you know, just kind of, you know, doing my thing. But then I started watching uh, a guy that kept preaching on the Holy Ghost every Sunday. Every Sunday, it seemed like he was preaching on the Holy Ghost, and I'd run down the basement, say, oh, God, fill me with the Holy Ghost. It wasn't happening. It took me a long time to finally realize that you just have to surrender and let the Holy Ghost do what he's going to do in your life. And I've been grateful for that, but it's not a fix-all. And we need to understand that. It, it, just because you get filled with the Holy Spirit does not mean everything changes to the point that you don't ever have any more problems. That you don't ever have any more difficulties. That there's no more struggles. Thank God you've got the Holy Spirit sometimes to pray you when you don't know how to pray yourself. Amen? Amen? Aren't you glad that sometimes you can just begin to speak in tongues and, and you don't know what you're saying, but you know God's pretty good at languages. You know, he made a bunch of them. Hello? I mean, there's so many languages all over the world, and every one of them is not without significance. Those people, when they talk to each other, they know what they're talking about. I remember we'd be off in France or Germany or wherever, and we'd be going up an escalator or whatever, and we'd hear these people talking in front of us. We had no idea what they were saying. Chris and I looked in there and we'd be going, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> thinking we were saying words. But it was different when I got filled. Israel, in this particular chapter, chapter 9 of the book of Nehemiah, if you want to turn there with me, um, in this particular chapter, Nehemiah and Ezra, it's like they're, they're buddies, they're, they're, they're hanging out together. They're, the wall had been built, the temple had been rebuilt, the children of Israel were back home in their homeland, but, but there was still stuff wrong. And you know what? You can get saved and you can get filled with the Holy Spirit, but you're going to discover in your life as you go along that there's still going to be some things that are wrong with you. And God's not going to stop working on you. Please don't misunderstand me. He's going to keep working on you from day to day. He's going to teach you some things that you don't know yet. He's going to put people in your path that's going to show you some things and show you the way. And that's what was going on in here. Ezra and, and uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, Ezra began to read the book of the law. And as he began to read the book of the law, the people began to understand the law. And then all the Levites and all the priests, they come along and they decide, well, we're going to read the law to you, but we're not only going to read it to you, we're going to explain it. We're going to tell you what it really means. And so they did that. And the people got to the place in their lives where that when he started to read it, it said that uh, the people began to weep. I learned a long time ago the conviction of God will make you weep. When all of a sudden you discover that everything's not right, something has gone awry, something has badly been misrepresented to you or whatever, and all of a sudden the joy, which... Nehemiah talks about the joy of the Lord is your strength, but well, we understand that the joy of the Lord should be our strength, but sometimes we find our strength, we think we do, in other things, and we think we get strength. But listen, the more I am with the Lord and the more I let the Lord be in me, I promise you I'm more joyful when He's with me than I am with anybody else. So they got to the place where they were weeping and they were crying they were under conviction as he, Ezra was reading the work book of the law to them and, and, and the translation that's in the message Bible it said it was the revelations of God those things that God revealed to them so that they might know how to live their lives do you realize that the place we live in right now most of our belief systems whether we're saved or lost are taken from the Bible a lot of them are taken from the book of Moses. That's why we don't kill people. That's why we don't lie. That's why we don't bear false witness. That's why we honor our parents. That's why we remember uh, our time to come to the house of God. But all of that stuff was given to us by God so that we, it might help us to live our lives. And it told us not to bear false witness against one another and, and, and not to do things that we shouldn't do and we shouldn't steal and all of that stuff. We learned all that from the Bible. And yet now we've got people that are anarchists and people that are crazy, I think, and trying to take all of that away and say, we don't need no law. Well, I think we need laws. 
But we don't live our lives according to the law of Moses. We live our lives according to the law of grace. Amen. What Jesus gave us. That's the way we're supposed to be living our lives under that so-called, and the word testament is also a poor translation. It was old covenant and new covenant. Jesus did not come to add the new covenant to the old covenant. He came to fulfill the old covenant. Are you all okay? And he came to a place where he was going to give you something new. Something totally different than they had. He said, I'm, in fact, even, it was even prophesied in Jeremiah. He said, I'm going to put my law in your hearts Amen. and in your minds Amen. so that you'll know how to do what you're supposed to do. Well, that's what Jesus did. He came and he took it off the wall of stone and he put it in the fleshy heart of human beings and it, his Holy Spirit instructs us in what we can do and what we're not supposed to do. But if you're not saved and you don't know these things, you think you can just do anything you want to and it's okay. Well, there's some things that we're not supposed to be doing as children of God. They were told, Nehemiah 8, they were told, stop weeping and start remembering what God has done for you. I'm going to say that to us. We need to stop our weeping and start remembering what God has done for us. And then when we see the unrest and we see the violence and we see all the stuff that's going on around us, it will cause us to weep over the losses of our nation, um, over the losses of individuals, rather than just weeping because the new temple doesn't look as good as the old temple. They were like, I remember that temple that Solomon built. This one here, it, it pales in significance. So listen, stop it. Remember what God did. Remember how God saved you. And, and, it, and it starts here in, in chapter 9. It said, Now on the 24th day of the month of the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. In other words, they were in a place of repentance. They're back home. God had freedom to get back home. But the repentance hasn't taken place yet. So something has to happen. And so... It said, and the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. In other words, they went back and said, Lord, I'm only sorry for what I did. I'm sorry for what my dad did and what my mama did and, and everybody. I mean, they were getting real serious about their relationship with God. And until we get real serious about our relationship with God, we will never have him in his fullness in our lives. Don't play. Pray, but don't play with God. Don't think for one moment you're getting away with anything. We can't. And they said, and they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day and another fourth part of the day. They worshiped the Lord and confessed their sins. I mean, anybody ready to stay here for three hours of worship and then three hours of confession? Be here for six hours. These folks were serious. This is a six hour ordeal. They heard the law. They listened to it attentively. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm appalled sometimes when I see how some folks, you start reading the word of God and you go, oh man, here we go. Listen, it ought to be food. It ought to be something of substance that says, let me draw from what's being said or what's being read because I need to be changed. I need to be made into what God wanted me to be. And it said, if they're stood up on the stairs of the Levites, and it gives a name. Uh, I'm not going to read all these names, but there was Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Sebadiah, I guess I'm going to read them. Bani, Sherebiah, uh, Bani, Kanani, and called. And this is, says, they cried with a loud voice unto the Lord their God. I remember one time, the guy was praying, and uh, man, he was like going 100 miles an hour in his prayer. It was loud. And uh, 
some guy walked up and says, you know what? He said, God's not deaf. He looked back and said, yeah, he's not nervous either. You can scream at God and you won't bother him. Or you can just speak in your spirit. You can walk along and, and think about what you're saying and, and God will hear you. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, that was happening to the disciples. They're over there talking amongst themselves who could be the greatest. And Jesus said, well, why reasoning among yourselves who could be the greatest? And, and he saw far, far off from that he can't even hear what they're saying. But he reads their thoughts. God reads your thoughts. He knows what's going on in your mind. That's why your mind cannot become a garbage can where you allow everything to flood your mind because it will eventually manifest itself in something horrible if you let it stay there. That's why the scripture tells us to think on whatsoever things are good, think whatsoever things are pure and lovely and of good report, virtuous things, things of praise. Get your mind on the right stuff. Be like Marty Metzger. Get away from your stinking thinking and don't let that stuff destroy your life. Because, listen, the devil wants to put all kind of garbage in your mind. Sorry. It's a plague for me. Because there's some things of my past that I just don't even want to think about talking about. That the devil is always, always trying to bring back up. I have to keep telling him, listen, devil. Jesus forgave me of those things. They're as far as the east, I'm from the west. God doesn't remember them, so please just get your 